Today we're beginning a new series, sermon series, on the book of 1 Thessalonians, which is actually a letter, but we call it a book. Um, there's a background that I want to begin with as we start this series on 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is believed to be one of Paul's first letters written to one of the churches. It was uh, written, um, estimated to be written around 50 A.D., so that's only about 17 years after Christ's death and resurrection and after the day of Pentecost and the beginning of the church. Um, there's a map that I want to have you take a look at. Go ahead, and there we go. So this just kind of gives you a picture. You're probably familiar um, with a little bit of the, there's the Mediterranean Sea, and on the right um, is kind of the area where Israel and Syria and so much of the stuff that's going on right now is happening over there. And then all the way to the top uh, left is where Thessalonica is. And the next image kind of zooms in a little bit, kind of a little closer view. And then with that, you can see, and the red line is actually representing Paul's, his second, what we call second missionary journey. You can see there uh, where Thessalonica is um, right there at the, at the top left. Thessalonica was founded in 350 315 BC by Cassandra, not Cassandra, Cassandar. <laughs> Cassandar. He was a, a general in Alexander the Great's army, and he named the city after his wife, Thessalonike. In 168 BC, Thessalonica became a Roman colony because Rome was in the business of taking over countries. <laughs> And in about 41 BC, um, it was given the, state, the status of free city by Octavius. Um, so it was able to kind of govern itself. Because of its location um, on the trade routes, and you can see it's right close to the, um, to the water and on a main, a main land uh, tr um, route, uh, it, was a very, it became a very prosperous um, city. The backdrop for the letter to Thessalonians can be found in Acts chapter 17. I'm just going to read this. It's just a, about 10 verses, verses, but it gives us the background for this letter. After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, you can see that on the map there. They had, um, right before this account in Acts chapter 17, they were in Philippi, and if you remember in Philippi, they got put in jail. There's in there. They're locked up in chains, and they're singing songs, and God causes an earthquake to, to shake the jail. The doors open. The chains fall off. Um, but that's Philippi. They left Philippi. They went through Epi Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, This is the Messiah Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and with the help of some ruffians, <laughs> love the choice of words there, with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. While they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring him out to the assembly, they attacked Jason's house. And when they could not find him, find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city authorities, shouting, These people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has entertained them as guests. They are all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this, and after they had taken Baal from Jason and the others, they let them go. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. So Paul and Silas and Timothy, he's not mentioned here, but he was traveling with them, were only in Thessalonica for like maybe a month or less. It says that he reasoned with in three Sabbaths, which would be three Saturdays, in their synagogues. And then the Jews caused an uproar, and because of this persecution, they left. So they didn't have time to disciple, to teach, to strengthen these new believers, this new church. 
And in light of the persecution from the Jews, and there would have been some persecution from the non-Jews as well, um, it's natural that they would have been concerned for, this, for these new believers and this new church. And so they sent a letter to find out how they were doing and to encourage them. So that's the backdrop, the background to this letter to the Thessalonians. We're going to take a look now um, at the first chapter of Thessalonians. And the question as we're going through this chapter that I want us to pay attention to is how are you known in the first chapter, we're going to see how Paul and his companions knew the Thessalonians. We're going to see how the Thessalonians knew Paul and Silas and Timothy. And we're also going to see how the Thessalonians were known by the, everyone around them. Verse 1 of Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. And you're thinking, if you're thinking, wait a minute, who's this Sylvanus? Because we, we just read the background story all about Paul and Silas, and there's no mention of a Sylvanus there. But uh, Silas was like a kind of a shortened version of Sylvanus, and uh, so it'd be sort of like Matt versus Matthew. And if you have the NIV version, they actually substitute Silas for Sylvanus. So don't worry, same guy. Our first question then, what did Paul, Silas, and Timothy know about the Thessalonians? We read that in verses 2 through 5. It says, We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. It's the first thing I want us to notice that Paul knew, Paul, Silas, and Timothy knew about the Thessalonians. They were chosen by God. Being chosen by God or being God's called God's chosen people, that was a big deal for the Jews. Do um, you remember where this idea of being God's chosen people originates um, in the Bible story? I think I heard an Abraham. Yes. God calls Abraham out of his home, homeland um, and then promises Abraham that he would make Abraham into a great nation and by um, his, by. Abraham's descendants would bless all the nations of the world. And later, he, God emphasizes this again through Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Before Jacob and Esau were born, um, he's, he, he proclaims that um, to, um, sorry, Jacob's mom, Rebecca, that the older son would serve Esau, the older son would serve the younger son, Jacob, and that it would be through Jacob that the descendants that God would establish his people, the Israelites. And the book of Malachi um, takes God's choosing Jacob a step further and connects it with God's love. And that's a connection that Paul makes. You remember in that verse we just read, brothers and sisters beloved by God that he has chosen. Um, in Malachi, that chapter 1, it, we read that this conversation that God's kind of going back and forth with the uh, the Israelite people, he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. And Paul kind of clarifies that in Romans chapter 9. He says, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And we kind of get, we attach some meanings to things um, like this idea of hating. We, um, we've attached a lot of negative um, emotion to that. 
But in context, it's really about the fact that God chose Jacob and not Esau. When God, when, when you think about that, when you choose something, you're not choosing something else. But it's very much connected, this choosing with God's love. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy knew the Thessalonians as people who were chosen by God. There's a couple reasons that's significant. The most obvious reason is that the creator of the universe, um, the true living God, wanted them. They're special. They were important to him. And I think another reason that's maybe not as obvious and that's significant is, and it has to do with the Jews, because um, we know from the, from the background that there were Jews that responded in Thessalonica, and there were Gentiles or non-Jews who responded. The Jews um, were very, um, like, um, very used to, I mean, they believed that they were God's chosen people. They were used to thinking of themselves as being special in God's sight and in his affection. And they uh, looked down on the Gentiles. Um, they even called them dogs. Now, in our culture where some people's dogs are like their children, <laughs> that doesn't mean as much. But trust me, when they referred to them as dogs, it was not a term of endearment. So Paul identifying all the Thessalonians as God's chosen people puts like he's establishing that everybody is on the same place. The Jews aren't more special than the, the non-Jews. Everybody is God's chosen people. Or the believers have become God's chosen people. All of them hold a special place in God's sight and in his affections. They are all loved. This reminds us of Paul's statement elsewhere where he says, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. We all have that same status. So Paul knew them to be chosen by God, and Paul declares that this was evident because the gospel came to them not only in word, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full complete conviction or complete certainty. And we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later, but the, the full certainty has to be there because they were making, they were believing in this gospel in an environment that was hostile to the, the Christian faith or this new, this new gospel message. And it's also evident by what they remembered. In verse 3, remember, it says they, were, they constantly remembered their work of faith their labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in Jesus. In other words, Paul and Silas and Timothy had witnessed changed hearts and lives. So what about us? What do people know about us? Do they see changed lives? Do they see works of faith? Do they see a labor of love? Do they see steadfastness and hope in Jesus? Those are the things that really matter. If you remember um, when, what Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, he says, when, when all is said and done in this life, there's three things that remain. You remember what those are? The three things that remain and abide, faith, hope, and love. So that's what um, the Paul, Silas, and Timothy knew about the Thessalonians. What did the Thessalonians know about Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and that is the rest of verse 5 and verse 6. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul says that the Thessalonians saw what kind of men they were. In fact, um, what kind of men they proved themselves to be among them. Paul, Silas, and Timothy demonstrated, um, they proved the message of the gospel by how they lived, by their actions. And they did this in the very, remember, the short time that they were with the Thessalonians. 
The Thessalonians knew that Paul and Silas and Timothy were not just coming to them with empty words of the gospel. They were eyewitnesses to how these men actually lived out the power of the gospel through the spirit within them. That's what the Thessalonians knew about Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and its results are interesting because it says they became imitators of them and the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always found that order odd. They became imitators of, it says that they became imitators of us and of the Lord, and it seems like the order should be the other way around, that the, the Lord should come first. Shouldn't uh, imitating Jesus take precedence over imitating a human? In some instances, actually, when we're reading, we read Paul instructs believers to imitate him and doesn't even mention anything about imitating Christ or God. So this might seem a little off, but it's really not. When you were a child, um, how was it that you began to learn basic things like walking and talking? You learn those basic things by watching others and then trying to do like others. And you, and you can ask any parent, um, there's probably a few things that they wished their kids didn't imitate about them. <laughs> Not to mention uh, the, their friends. <laughs> um, like it or not, we are the example by which people, and especially non-Christians, will determine who Jesus is like, what he is like. And that's so important that our lives are genuinely changed and that we are striving daily to be more like Christ. And it's why it's so important to consider carefully those Christians that we may be trying to imitate. Um, there is hardly anything worse than someone who affirms the gospel with words and all the while contradict the gospel and how they live. The question for us then is, how are we doing at imitating Christ? Are those that are, who may be watching us and imitating us, are they being drawn closer to the image of Christ? Or are they being pushed away and drawn further away because they, they, don't, see, they don't see a matchup and they don't see the spirit um, and they don't see the power of the gospel in our lives? The Thessalonians became imitators of Paul and Silas and Timothy and of the Lord, and became an example to everyone around them. The next verses 7 through 10. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia, where the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Now I've emphasized the, the individual aspect of our faith and how uh, we are known by others, but what about us as a whole? as a church? How are we, we viewed by the people around us, by the people in our own city? Paul says of the church in Thessalonica that the word of the Lord sounded forth from them in Macedonia and Achaia and everywhere. And Macedonia would be like a region. It would be sort of like Sault Ste. Maria in the region of the UP. <laughs> okay, So it's what had happened in Thessal Thessalonica had people knew about it, people heard about it. One of the most notable evidences was in how they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's a big deal. We, it doesn't really register for us, but that was their culture. Everyone, everywhere around them, worshipped the gods, the Greek gods or the Roman gods or some other gods that had become cults and were accepted. And the, Turning, from, turning away from those idols was a big deal. Um, they, they were fearful of these gods and that, that people turning away from them um, the God would anger the gods and might even um, cause 
the gods to bring trouble on them because of people converting to Christ. It would bring displeasure on the, not it bring displeasure on the communities. It might not affect the Christians. But so they were very much afraid and very much it was a big problem for Christian or people to be converting to Christianity. Paul alludes to this um, previously in verse six, where it talks about how they received the word in much affliction. From the background passage from Acts 17, we witnessed the hostility of even the Jews to the new Christians in the church. So this is kind of hard for us to relate to in our American culture. Um, we've been predominantly Christian or influenced by Christianity since its founding. People coming, becoming Christians in our country for most of the last 200 years were not probably followers of some other religion. They were just not religious, becoming Christian. However, that's not the case, and it has not been the case in much of the rest of the non-Western world. In countries like India, for example, where Hinduism is the main religion, converting to Christianity can result in becoming ostracized by both your family and your community, even to the point of losing employment, even losing your life. So it was a big deal converting to God, um, to following the living God from turning away from these idols. So that, and that message, like, like that had spread around. People knew about what they had done and about how they had um, treated and received Saul and, or Paul, Silas, and Timothy. The question then for us, though, is how does our community see our church? What reputation for living out the gospel do we have? And one thing came to my mind immediately um, is our food pantry. Um, we've, it's been going on here for years and has blessed um, and been a blessing in the lives of many, many people for a long time. That's something that people uh, may know about this congregation. Um, and that's a positive thing. But what about other ways? Does the community around us know that we actually live out our lives by what we say believe? Do they know that we actually genuinely love and care for each other? Um, it's, it's actually important how we're known. I want to conclude um, with one last way that Paul and Silas and Timothy knew the Thessalonians, and actually more importantly, how God knew the Thessalonians. We touched on it just a little. It's in verse 4 where it says that Paul identifies the Thessalonians as being beloved by God. This is a tr truth that really is transformative, and it's really the heart of the gospel message. The Roman and Greek gods, they didn't love their subjects, the people that worshipped them. Um, in fact, the, the people often attributed um, the gods with great mischief and trouble upon themselves. And they had to go to great lengths to try to gain the favor of the gods. And then even after you thought you maybe you gained the favor of gods or were doing what you needed to, um, that favor could be lost at any time. This is, what, this is the way that they lived in this fear and always trying to, you know, wondering what the gods are going to do next. What do I got to do to please them? Imagine then that you learn that there is a God, a living and true God who loves you, who would call you beloved, a God who would send his own son to die for all your sin, all your weaknesses, all your imperfections. And in a way, I was thinking about it, it's almost like God is choosing you over his son by choosing to let his son die in your place. What an amazing kind of love is that. And that is probably one of the most important ways that Paul, Silas, and Timothy knew those Thessalonians. And it's true not just for the Thessalonians. It's true for each and every one of us. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever 
would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You are loved by God. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your status is, what struggles or difficulties you're going through. Um, Maybe you compare yourself to others and you see yourself as less than. It doesn't matter. You are loved by God. You are beloved by God. I'll just say that one more time because sometimes we need to hear it three times. You are loved by God. I'm going to pray and the worship team is going to come up and we'll have our closing song.